ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Solimar Salas and I'm the Vice President for Museum Content and Programming at the Museum of Latin American Art. We welcome you today, Wednesday, December 9, to this edition of the MOLA Zoom Project in conversation with the artist Guillermo Bert, where MOLA Chief Curator Gabriela Urtiaga will discuss the artist and his work. We also thank the Dwight Stewart Youth Fund and the Kenneth T. L and Eileen L. Norris Foundation, the Arts Council for Long Beach, the South California Edison Foundation for their constant support of the educational programming at the Museum of Latin American Art. In each chapter, the conversation with the artist and our Mola chief curator places the focus on a series of specific artworks which requires a close inspection and deliberate process of contemplation and exploration, delving into the ideas surrounding the creation of the works, their sources of research and inspiration in an effort to immerse ourselves in the world of the artists. In chapter four of Mola Zoom project, we will interview the renowned artist Guillermo Bert, who lives and works in Los Angeles, California. The talk explores the different methods he uses to reconcile and explore his bicultural experience between Chile and the USA, and how he infuses this dynamic in his decades long practice of working with cultural symbols of urbanism, consumerism, displacement, and migration. Guillermo Bert, born in Chile in 1959, his career as an artist and art educator has developed in many ways. From art director of the Los Angeles Times between 1995 and 2000, to professor of mixed media in the Art Center School of Design in Pasadena, California. His exhibitions and samples of his film work have been held in more than 30 institutions. The Museum of Latin American Art, MOLA, the Pasadena Museum of California Art, Museum of Art and Design in New York, among others. Bird has had his work exhibited in the Blanton Museum in, during the LALA Pacific Standard Time Initiative at the Craft Contemporary Museum, the Craft and Folk Museum, the UC Riverside Museum of Art, and the Nevada Museum of Art. His work has been the subject of national and international publications, such as the Smithsonian Magazine, El País, the Los Angeles Times, and the LA Weekly and supported by the Center for Curatorial Innovation at the National Association of Latinos Art, Arts and Culture. Welcome, Mr. Guillermo Berg. Thank you for being here. And I leave you with Gabriela Ortiaga, the MOLA Chief Curator. Enjoy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Salimar and all the MOLA team. Uh, thank you for uh, your introduction. Hello, everyone, and welcome to MOLA. I hope you are well and safe, and thank you for joining us today. I am Gabriel Urtiaga, a chief curator at the Museum of Latin American Art, and we are so excited to present to all of you our Zoom project, Chapter 4, featuring a great Chilean and multidisciplinary artist, Guillermo Bert. And who lives and works in LA for more than 40 years. And hola Guillermo, how are you? And thank you, thank you so much for this meeting. Thank you for opening up your studio to MOLA and our audience. We are so pleased to have you with us today. Uh, thank you, Gabriela, for the invitation. And I really uh, have a very special place uh, for MOLA. I did a, an exhibition there like uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and it was very important for the development of this, this new uh, body of work. Well, well, Guillermo, uh, how are you doing? Uh, how are you feeling during this special and difficult time? Uh, you know, I think that um, it's been challenging uh, to adapt to the uh, different, um, uh, you know, the, being in, well, I mean, it's, it's not a bad thing to be in the studio all the time, but the mm -hmm. fact that you don't have contact with other artists or you can go do events and exhibit the work the way you normally do uh, is, is, is complicated. Uh, and, yeah. and in the human uh, aspect of, you know, the society at large, how everybody's doing. But, um, but oh, you know, overall, I've been working, I've been working Quite a, quite a bit in the studio, and uh, I've been producing, like, you know, without having to to be in all of those places precisely. So I've been concentrated in the work, and 
the, the fact that we have this opportunity to connect with people online through Zoom or, or other things yeah. uh, is, is kind of new and probably going to be something that the people are going to adopt in the future as well. But uh, it's, it's been uh, prolific and, uh, and it's been good all, all the way through. Okay, Guillermo. Well, I, I would like to invite you to start our conversation about some specific series that we prepare to share with uh, the audience. And can you tell us about your creative process in your prolific career? Well, I mean, there's so many different stages. Um, maybe I can talk to the piece that you have in front of, of me here in the screen. Yes. Yes. Um, this piece is, is owned by uh, uh, Mola precisely. It's part of the permanent collection of Mola. And it's a very specific, uh, very particular piece because it was done in, in Oaxaca and yeah. um, by the, this collaborative group that is the family, it's the mother and three daughters, um, the Navarro sisters, that they all weave together, as you see in the bottom there, they all weave together uh, under the trees in this backstrap loom. So they tie it up to the, to the tree and then through the back, and then they just can, um, so that only they can uh, weave like 12 inches at a time. You know, they're, they're kind of small women. And then there's this very small area that they can weave. And then, so to do those pieces, we had to do it in sections, but yeah. the designs and the kind of um, colors and all the different uh, imagery that they use uh, we, we use it and we kind of con combine it uh, and it was very interesting, the process. Uh, beautiful people and, and great textiles. Uh, yeah. But the main thing, of course, is, is inside the code, uh, the relationship between the technology and the traditional uh, technique. In this yeah. particular case, they have a code, a barcode in the, in the middle of the, the tap tapestry that they also woven uh, in there. And you can scan it, and they have the um, the story of a poet, Natalia Toledo, that is a very important poet in Mexico, and then she teach Zapotecs to the kids, um, so to the new generation. Even in fact, she came to Los Angeles to show some of that uh, that knowledge. This is a yeah. short video that is show some of the stuff in in the code. Okay, Guillermo, and why did you decide to put the focus in this linking about pre-Columbian textile and the QR code? Well, I, I for, for quite a bit, I was doing vertical codes, which is the traditional code. And then uh, those codes were essentially um, used for pricing, put the price of merchandise, you know, commerce. So I thought, uh, you know, in, in, in capitalism, you know, like the code and, and pricing and, and selling product is, is so relevant. So I thought uh, it would be interesting to determine what is, what is the price of democracy or what is the price of justice. And then I did this code that represent that. And they were very interesting um, in that regard. But then the, the new QR code uh, readers came about, uh, the one in top left, and then that's what everybody's using for uh, all kind of product, but it has contained a lot more uh, information. So essentially you can scan it and go to a website or see a product or see images or you know video, audio, et cetera. So I thought when I saw this, I, I thought this looked just like tapestries, traditional tapestries uh, from Colombian, you know, like from Chile or from some, some other places in Latin America. So I start uh, investigating how can it be put together, what, you know, the mathematics of the codes. And I try to, I mean, I did my own encoding to figure out how they look and what kind of information you can put in there. And then I decide to use the second code, which is the Aztec code. The Aztec code, it looked like uh, the, it's a pyramid seen from above. So mm -hmm. essentially there's different plateaus. Uh, if, uh, you were flying over and then you see the pyramid. Uh, and that Aztec code is not really well, I mean, widely used, and but it's available in the family of the of the, the barcodes. So when you have the app to scan uh, the QR reader, usually it come with the app to scan the Aztec code and, and all the other codes too. Mm -hmm. So I decided to use the Aztec because of the relationship with Latin America in this particular case. And then uh, I use that and we 
woven into the tapestries and then we can able to scan it and access to the stories that have been fading away in Latin America, but you can uh, really capture it and, and, and woven uh, we, with the stories within the pattern of the, of the tapestry. So it's a combining the two technologies together, essentially. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, according to uh, uh, your AdWords uh, Zapotec poet, uh, I would like to share with the audience uh, the Zapotec poet uh, reading by Natalia uh, Toledo uh, that you mentioned before. Okay. Gukkanu slasha diusi, gie bijinja nemigu. Gukkanu jaga ku cesabelle, bakanda ne libana ku nibi sose bidanu. Biaba nun dani gitsi, ku bija bitidi vasa stila cidonu. Gukkanu pumpu au, gukkanu nissa au, biana nakkanu de, biana sa na gitsu gijila iu. Un dia yo me dediqué, me, me, me dije, Voy a, voy a sacar esto, lo puse y, y lo guardé y después este, más adelante lo mostré a, a esa amiga de la que yo te hablo, que también es poeta, se llama Rocío González y, y ella es juchiteca, o sea, también es de mi pueblo y, y entonces ya me dijo, no, pues sí hay una vena poética, eh, sigue trabajando, lo que te dicen los que ya avanzaron un poco, los que ya publicaron, ¿no? Y, y, y así, de niña, dormí en los brazos de mi abuela como la luna en el corazón del cielo. La cama, algodón que salió de la fruta del pochote. Guchitenia strompi pibine laza. Negué estima tamor o gucabe huachinia bitua. Chiriquitenia cabizana. Somos independientes económicamente desde chiquitas. Nos ganamos la vida este, y por lo mismo tenemos una presencia. Cuando, cuando tú eres eh, económicamente autosuficiente, ya no dependes del otro, que es una manera muy triste y muy, muy cabrona para de someter a alguien. ¿no? Muchos estudiosos dicen que es un matriarcado, pero si eso es el matriarcado, <risa> pues no me, a mí no me conviene. <risa> Aparte de todo, este, hay que continuar en la casa, ¿no? No, no se renuncia, es que son dos trabajos. Y a veces gana más la mujer, que eso es lo, más, este, <risa> lo que ofende más al otro sexo. <risa> Viendo que los chavos ¿no? este, o los niños ya están hablando muy poco el zapoteco, el español está ganándole mucho a... Eh, mucho territorio y, y estamos viendo que pues en las escuelas no les enseñan este zapoteco no lo refuerzan, entonces inventamos un proyecto que ha funcionado mucho pues hemos estado por todo el Istmo de Tehuantepec dando un taller de lectoescritura que esa es la parte de la que se encarga Víctor Cata que es historiador y lingüista y yo de creación literaria entonces vemos las dos partes eh, les enseñamos cómo se escribe cómo se lee en zapoteco porque estos libros por ejemplo tienen mucho sentido hacerlos en forma bilingüe porque estás apelando a dos lectores, el lector en, en, la, en tu lengua eh, originaria y el del de, español, pero muchas veces somos analfabetas en nuestro propio idioma, entonces eh, me, a mí los niños, muchos de, de los de ahora me pueden leer directamente en español y seguramente no harán el esfuerzo de, de tratar de entender y tratar de leer en zapoteco porque nadie les enseña. Caro cuichi que me venda sacaca gusi duluda, galai que la haga dura si vele cru, cayaca que tasuki, cadie doria neguise, cayaca que endaró, callaba ni saguie guijilayu, luchau y dujuladi, nendani te gigandopa, ride du telayu. Very, very, very interesting, Guillermo. Um, I am I am really interested in in this series because I can see this series like an open art world, right? Because it's not only an aesthetic experience, sharing the knowledge that you transmit with the history of the communities and millenarian technique, but also people can interact. With your war, right? Yeah, it's, it's it make it really alive. It's not like a, 
like a tradition, like only in the, in the past, but uh, what, what's going on right now with those uh, ancient cultures, uh, you know, the Mayan, the Zapotecs, uh, the Mapuche, you know, um, the Akuma in the Southwest. And uh, so when, when you tell, uh, you kind of interview the elderly or the poets or the, you know, uh, medicine man, they really have a, a, a knowledge and, and a tradition that's been passed through, um, you know, from from um, for oral tradition essentially, and uh, this is, you know, sort of like an oral tradition in twenty first century where you encapsulate those those uh, those stories into these codes and then you can pass it along, uh, and then uh, the younger generation react really strongly about it because they don't like to kind of read book if you wish in the sense that they had to dig out the past as something that it already is, is gone. But when you see it alive in the tradition alive and just keep, keep the, the tradition uh, going from generation to generation in a more interactive way, uh, I, I see that there is a, is a lot of interest from, from the youngsters. Yeah. And uh, how important is the presence of the code, for example, in our next uh, ad work, uh, the visionary from 2012? Because using uh, the data embedded in the barcode, you are talking about indigenous migrant experience into the local Los Angeles cultural narrative, as well as the global dialogue with immigration and Latin American origin, right? Well, this particular piece of the vision is one of the early pieces. So it's very limited of the amount of uh, data we can put in there because um, con in contrast with the, what they were doing right now, uh, this one, we use the language capable uh, of being encoded in, in, you know, I think there were 32, um, uh, Characters that you can actually encode in the in the in the code, and uh, this if let's say if there's no internet, you can still read it because this is not online; it's actually in, in the code. Yeah. But um, the more recent pieces, uh, like the like La Bestia, which is the one with a with a train in the middle, that is more like the connection with Los Angeles, and that yeah. is more interactive in the sense that it has a video in it or. You know, like a like a like a file, like the, the other type of file. Yes, uh, Guillermo, re regarding community. yes, regarding La Bestia from 2017, that is part right. of Lagma collection right now, right? Um, right. Yes, this is amazing. Yeah, like, Lagma just acquired this piece for the permanent collection, and uh, it was very interesting because since we're talking about the pandemic and how you know, difficult is the communication and, and everything. Uh, and they bought it through a Zoom, you know, they all got together with the donors and everything and, and somebody uh, bought it through the Zoom for the museum, which is, is a great way to use technology nowadays that is so difficult to go around. But uh, in this particular piece, uh, yes, um, you know, the train that is, is portrayed in the, uh, in, in the background, in the center is, uh, is La Bestia. And La Veste is a train that used to bring people from the border of Guatemala and Mexico all the way through Mexico to the border to the United States. And the people used to come and go on the, the, the roof of the, the, the train and stay there for 10 days, strap themselves, sleep there and all of that. And many people died and fall off or, you know, got, got uh, robbed or whatever. So it was very terrible, but uh, that happened for, you know, for hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of immigrants. Um, so this piece, uh, the big that with the image, uh, the, the technique is very interesting the way it was done with a laser three-dimensionally on, on the canvas. But the code, is you just scan the code, um, you, you can uh, actually, we found somebody in Los Angeles that he came in that train and is here from the Guatemala, you know, um, diaspora, if you wish. Uh, and then uh, we interview him and he, uh, tell us about his lifestyle there, the journey in La Bestia, and how is he doing here in Los Angeles. So the 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 full relationship uh, with you know the, their village and Los Angeles and, and the whole story is, is encapsulated in this code. Yeah, and how was the the relationship with the community in this case? in sharing your idea to, to transferring the symbols 
to a mix with contemporary language. But at the same time, uh, it looked like a pre-Columbian Mesoamerican symbol. What is the, the connection that you discover here? Because uh, I, I think that uh, in this particular piece is a little different with others, right? Because you are adding uh, behind the QR code an image of the La Bestia train, a terrible situation for human being. And you uh, add in and express at the same time the color of culture and land of Guatemala country. Yeah, I mean, uh, every culture in the, within the um, pre-Columbian -pre cultures, uh, they have their own weaving style and their own palette. So it's, this, the, the, the Mayans are really, you know, they use every color in the, in the palette pretty much, and they're very bright. And the, the iconography is like flowers and birds and you know the whole thing about the different animals. Um, so we use that pattern and that pa palette uh, and those iconography to create this piece. Uh, I was working with this organization called Chela 8 that is uh, in um, Chinatenango. It's like uh, in the middle kind of north of uh, Guatemala. And um, it's totally Mayan land there. Uh, they speak uh, Mom, which is the Mayan language, uh, one of the Mayan languages. And then um, they helped me out. We, they, they have a nonprofit that help them to, you know, with development and education and health. But also they have a weaving co community. They create this tapestry. So I work with them and they allow me to produce my, my designs and they will be able to uh, weave it. Uh, with the traditional iconography. And then we install these codes and, and all of that stuff. Uh, and this piece uh, traveled to France uh, to a big show last year, and it's been in, in multiple museums in, in New York and Los Angeles. Uh, so I'm very happy that a lot of people were able to see it and, and listen to the story and, and experience, experience the whole thing, just the tapestry, the, the, the craft and the technology associated with it. Of, of course, of course. Um, well, uh, Guillermo, uh, as an artist, not only interesting in your own contemporary time, but also in your ancestral time, uh, you were developing a very important series. And I think uh, we are ready to see the video about another series, Tumble Dream from 2018. Uh, a powerful and political video installation which operate like a metaphor for the nomadic life and destinies of the immigration people along the southern border in the United States. Yes, uh, this is more recent. Uh, this is only two years ago. And it was uh, a grant that I got a COLA grant from the city of Los Angeles. So. This exhibition was at the Municipal Art Gallery, Barnstall Park, um, and um, it was very experimental. So they give you the grant and then you have the money to produce the show. But kind of one of the things that they push you to create a work that otherwise you wouldn't be able to create. So it's like a new thing, you know, it's not just to continue with what you're doing, but if you have an idea and you want to develop it, you jump on it. And it was very interesting because um, in this uh, case, we, um, uh, you know, I had this idea about the tumbleweed, the relationship in the tumbleweed with, with the immigrants, you know, being in the desert, you know, the, the wind just take them anywhere they want with an uncertainty and very rough conditions. So I thought this is look like an immigrant crossing the border. So I, I thought that would be the perfect format to project these stories. So we did a series of interviews uh, with people that cross the border there in the United States and they tell how, how difficult and, and, and terrible was with the, the transition. And um, those stories were projected into tumbleweed. So essentially the room was painted black and these, these pieces, the tumbleweed were hung in different heights. And then uh, we did a thing called mapping projection, which is scanning the entire room and and you know, focus every single one, map every th single uh, tumbleweed in the room, and then throw a video to each one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was a multi-projection installation, but the main one was uh, the description and the person in the interview 
and the re the rest of them they were um, just uh, be roll about freeways and and trains and cars and uh, freeways. So it's the is the is the journey, you know, the the road to LA. You know, how how many days, how many months they had to walk and and and, and take all these different forms of transportation to cross the entire, you know, probably like twenty thousand miles or something, and. Um, so, so yeah, some, some of them in the top, there's people crossing the river, as you see, very abstract. And in the back, there's people in boats uh, crossing the border in between Guatemala and Mexico. So we filmed through the entire, you know, the border in Guatemala, in Mexico, and in Los Angeles, the border. And then all of those images are projected simultaneously uh, in there. But the main, like in, in, in these two images, the one in the bottom is like the person that is talking and it looked like it's made of straw, like it's part of the tumbleweed dream. So the, the tumbleweed. So the tumbleweed is talking to you and telling you the story of the journey. But um, so, and, and then we, the, the, the name of the series is called Tumble Dreams because it's sort of like the dreams are tumbling and then uh, you don't know about the future or, 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 you know, the outcome of the entire journey. Yeah, well, uh, one of the most important topics here that I can see is that you contribute to maintain the memory of identity, culture, and the reality for many people, right? It's like a lecture about the US, but this issue of immigration and the difficulties that they face also exists around the world. And I would like to invite our audience to see the, to watch the video. Llevo ya 18 años en este país. Tengo dos hijos y mmm, trabajo, soy madre soltera. He aprendido a sobrevivir y me imaginé en un momento empecé a visualizar mi vida en el pueblo de mi abuelita arriando chivos y viendo a mi hijo en el campo y viendo los buitres del pueblo encima de mí porque una mujer embarazada ya es como un objeto sexual para los hombres y yo no me quise ver así eh, o sea yo preferí arriesgar mi vida y la de mi bebé eh, venirme a buscar una mejor vida en Estados Unidos éramos 18 pero una señora se quedó en el camino con su bebé y el niño de 3 años y nadie regresó por ella en ese momento yo pues dije Dios mío es mi vida o me quedo con la señora de sus hijos también y pierdo también yo mi energía o tal vez mi vida también y es duro que en ese momento aprendí que estamos en una jungla que el más fuerte sobrevive el débil lo mata no se muere y me sentí así porque en ese momento no podía hacer nada Well, Guillermo, can, can we explore a little more about uh, the process of the research and your commitment about this issue? Well, uh, yeah, it is, it, it is uh, like you said, like universal uh, subject matter, um, because what's happening in you know, Syria or the, the refugees in Europe or, uh, you know, you know the, uh, the Middle East in general, uh, it's, it's been, a, a, you know, Ter terrible in that regard. So this is not a local thing, but since we live in Los Angeles and this is, and, and I coming from Latin America, the Exodus, you know, it's part of the Exodus series. Uh, there's been, you know, millions and billions, like maybe 20 millions of Latin American uh, people coming, crossing to the to North to looking for a better life and, you know, escaping for wars and, you know, uh, all sort of issues in Latin America. So yeah, it definitely is a, is a, is a you know, uh, um, terrible situation, and they express really well. So, I mean, the idea is to humanize and, and, and so that people understand what they go through, you know? Some people believe that, you know, these people cross because they just want to have a, you know, uh, whatever, it's just like a, they're looking for money or something, but they're looking for a better life, it's just a way to raise their children and the way to actually, um, you know, escape from, from abuse or from poverty or for, um, violence, you know, which is very common uh, also. So yeah, that, that's a way to kind of give the face to, to this tragedy.
Yeah. Well, Guillermo, the other uh, important series that I would like to talk with you is about the price of democracy series uh, that is connecting uh, with our time again, right? Uh, you mix the American symbols with the vertical uh, barcode that are normally used to sell something. Uh, what a, a, a metaphor, right? And we can find many different things here, layer by layer. Uh, and can you explain us about your major idea? Well, uh, <clears throat> That this this ex exhibition actually I did in 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 in, in Mola in two thousand and fourteen I think, 14. Um, or fifteen. Uh, well, that was a Peter Blake, but uh, it was a little bit before that. And um, so this series uh, was the beginning of the encoding and the barcoding, and then transferring that information into digital. Uh, so in in the midst of the digital revolution, I thought that it was very relevant. And, uh, you know, I like the idea that the barcode is something so flat and so, so um, insignificant. Uh, and in, but it's kind of tell you the price of the object. But when I turn it into these icons, you know, they are large format pieces and they are saturated with the paint, uh, the um, mo uh, automobile uh, uh, paint, you know, like uh, Corvette colors, uh, uh, candy apple and, you know, very saturated uh, uh, colors. So they kind of reflect and become like a, like a real uh, sensuous uh, piece of uh, reflective surfaces. And um, so it, it gives you sort of like a different, uh, it's like an icon of the contemporary or consumer society, if you wish. You know, they're referring to the price of democracy. So I have to be good looking, the price of democracy. And in that regard, you put this piece in the, in the wall and it's like an icon, you know, it's like something to people will uh, feel like this is represent, uh, you know, the, the, the consumer or the, the price or the wealth or the greed of uh, all of these processes. Uh, democracy, the, I did these pieces during the Bush administration and the, uh, the war in the Gulf, uh, in the Gulf. And um, so the idea was, you know, they said some pieces related to that, but it's the idea that democracy was imposed in the Middle East because of the interest, the strategic interest in the region with was oil. So in essence, we were selling democracy uh, to try to exchange it for oil in a way. And you know, you know what's happened with that, you know, the, the, you know, billions of people probably died through these 30 years or 20 years. And then um, nothing much was accomplished. I mean, in fact, uh, the region is a total chaos. So, um, you have to question, you know, what what the values? How do you share the values with other societies? And how, uh, you know, the, the what is what is, you know, the, the financial price is one thing, but what is the, the human, humanitarian price, uh, the the price of that? And then that doesn't have a financial um, equivalent. So we have to be very cautious about that uh, in politics, for sure. Yeah. And what do you decide to select uh, these iconic symbols and not other? Because we have some examples uh, here. Yeah, uh, well, we, we did, this is very generic in, in the sense that they were very pure barcode with the price of democracy. Uh, in, in, the, in the one in the bottom, in the left, uh, that vertical piece, it, it says uh, um, red, um, red, uh, red carpet white lies and uh, blue chip. So they all reference to the colors and the, you know, the, the, what they mean. Like in this one, democracy pattern in the left, uh, yeah. that piece, each one of the squares, it says the word democracy. But if you see it in the entire thing, uh, you know, when you see it, uh, you would never guess that that's, you know, democracy being used to create this pattern. And, um, and that's, you know, I, I thought it'd be interesting because some of the content and some of the subliminal aspect of all of this work is like, you don't know what, what it means, but it seems to be something very abstract and, and kind of um, something that you don't, you cannot access to the real content of it. And um, that's interesting because democracy is something that is not simple. It's not uh, easy, you know, it's something, you know, that you have to forge. Uh, so, People see it more very superficial 
and 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 because we have it, then we don't we don't be concerned about it or we don't think much about it. But so I create this this icon with those uh, relationships, and and people might start thinking about what are the meaning of the work and the meaning of democracy in this particular case. Mm-hmm. In the piece at the right, uh, so I start combining. Um, you know, pieces that are pre-Columbian actually with the vertical barcode. And uh, in this particular case, uh, it's sort of like the price of the globalization, you know? And then the issue in this particular case was uh, uh, the series, it's called El Dorado, you know, like the, all the, the, you know, the idea of the, of the greed and the, the desire for gold, but that also how the culture play a role in that relationship. And in this case, uh, the, pre-Columbian, uh, you know, world, the pre-Columbian world in general, uh, indigenous in America or in anywhere in, in, the, in the planet, uh, the, the one they want, the, the one that will, they suffer the most with globalization in the sense that they are not very strong participants in, this, in the decision making on the, in the global uh, uh, level. And mm-hmm. so essentially they are, you know, they, they just, they are usually uh, suffer the consequences of globalization without uh, taking the advantages that globalization generate. So that's why is this com- com- combination of the, the, the traditional uh, goddess and then the greed of the codes and then the, the new iconic uh, representation of these cultures. Yeah. I mean, it's a little, uh, it's, it's like, a, like a black humor type of thing to some, some kind of irony in involved. Yeah, well, uh, Guillermo, I know the language and communication is really important in your production, right? And the message is something explicit and sometimes uh, subliminal. Can you explain more to us about uh, your methodology in this interesting process of research regarding uh, the ad war you don't have the right from 2007? Right. Um, Well, this is more recent, like uh, the Neon series is more uh, current. Uh, I'm doing this uh, for the last few years. And then uh, I add in other pieces as, as we go along. And there's, there's a few, few pieces that are in the process now. But uh, this particular piece is very current. I mean, this is just right now. You don't have the right to remain silent. You know, the, the words, of course, is you have the right to remain silent. You know, if they, the police come to you and said, gather up measures, so you don't incriminate yourself. But you don't have the remain. Uh, the, you don't have the right to remain silent. I mean, like it's a moral imperative that you speak out of what you see. You cannot just you know, keep quiet when things are happening that you don't agree or feel like they're kind of outrageous. So uh, I, I think it resonates with a lot of people, uh, you know, the, this idea. And hopefully, you know, I've been exposed and, and shows and, and, and different media. Uh, so I, I hope that the message is coming across. Uh, but there's a number of other pieces and the, the whole series is called Soundbite uh, mm-hmm. because I don't know if because I'm, I'm uh, from Chile originally uh, and English wasn't my first language. So uh, I found something really interesting in the way the, the English language express ideas. And um, I, um, so I, I get mesmerized by the, 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 the kind of things that you can do with the language while, it, because it doesn't sound familiar from the beginning. So when I, I heard all this expression I try to determine what what is behind it, how it was constructed, how we come about, and then then I kind of play around with it and make it to have a different meaning. Um, so so yeah, to me, I, I think it's an edge, and and also it give me a certain advantage to be a foreigner because then you you you, you have a second view. You know, it's not like something that is ordinary, but it become like extraordinary in a way. Mm-hmm. And then you can use that to, to infuse your work, essentially. Wow, this is look powerful, Guillermo. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your explanation. And I would like to open the Q&A session for our audience. That would be great. Hello, everyone. My name is Jorge. I'll be moderating the Q&A. Um, so if you haven't already, please send in your questions to the chat. Um, 
but I can get the ball rolling with a question from my end. Um, actually, a question just came in, so we'll go with that one. Uh, from Susanna Franick. Uh, Hola, Guillermo. What a treat to see all your work and how diverse and deep it is. And love that it's framed in social justice notions. From where do you draw your inspiration and ideas? Well, um, like I was just mentioning, um, the, the double vision that I have coming from, from Chile in, in this particular case. And then, um, you know, I, I, I went to college while Pinochet was in power. So uh, you really know, understand in politics what the excess of power really could mean. It's a very serious matter. And then people that, you know, in America particularly, you know, they, they don't quite understand. I mean, now we have a situation where we're very to the blink of getting to a situation that it could lead to that. So, but when you live through that and you lose your personal freedom and then, uh, you know, society become like, uh, you know, very extreme in that regard, uh, you kind of feel that, you know, when you see, you talk, think about, plan, you know, in, in a planetary uh, way, uh, you know, democracy and freedom is not really abundant around the world. Uh, we have a certain advantages here in the United States, but around the world is very limited. And uh, as it's important to, to make those points and make people not be too comfortable and understand the society and participate and, and kind of understand immigration issues and other parts of the world and uh, not be so self-centered and, and kind of be more open. And it's like, a, you know, America is tend to be kind of the, the, the internal politics is one thing, but the external politics is completely different. And that is, is a mistake. I think that they should really uh, have a vision that is more global. And, and this is happening in, in many levels, but it, sh it should be more broad, I would say. Uh, just to follow up on that, what do you think that process of um, raising awareness on a global level looks like? And what, what role do you think art plays in that? Well, I think that um, it's, it's curious because um, there's, a, there's a new wave of artists that they are generating uh, a more political work, but it's, uh, but it's very small in relation to the, what you call the art world. The art world is, is, is in the different, uh, you know, there's, there's some other ideas that is, 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 is the primary um, intention is, is not into that direction, but it's a very strong uh, direction now that is kind of focusing in, in um, and you know, the VNLs and you know, some of the stuff help uh, to produce that kind of work, but um, not uh, because of the commercial aspect of, of art and galleries and the commercial galleries and all that, you know, that the, they, they diffuse, they water down the art to make it more friendly, you wish, and then uh, you lose a lot of the content or the potential that it could, could be in a, in a higher level, you know? So, I mean, I try to create a, a work that is working different levels. So, I mean, you know, some people can understand a certain level of, of the work and, and be interesting and, you know, could get some knowledge out of that, but then you can go deeper and, or, or to uh, formulate your own ideas too, in turn of these kind of open questions, you know? So that's, that's my, my, uh, my goal. Definitely. Um, and you don't have to go into specifics here, but where do you think your art is leading or heading to? Do you see yourself continuing down this path of utilizing technology uh, or using symbols of technology in your work? Yes, definitely. Uh, yeah, we're going into the, the digital world full steam and uh, they have so many ideas for installation that use, uh, you know, LED. I've been working a lot with LED and, 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 and um, you know, so you, you create um, patterns and, uh, you know, the, the idea of perception uh, with the technology, you know, with uh, virtual reality or uh, augmented reality. But you have to, I mean, it's very important that you don't um, take off in a way that is purely technological and then it's just uh, the technology for, for, for itself, um, for its own sake type of thing. But it has to be grounded. You know, and then because I had that that kind of idea of the immigrant the identity, digital identity in, in the, you know in this new world, um, what it what it mean, you know, but if you use the technology of the day, 
it really makes a lot of sense, but you have to go to the past and understand history and other elements to make it more meaningful, not just something that it will be like a gimmick, you know? So that's, that's my goal. Um, but yeah, definitely, I, I, I love technology. Definitely. Uh, and just to kind of go back a little bit, um, we didn't go into much detail about this, but can you talk about the influence of Chile uh, in your early and current practice? Well, I, I, I formed myself in Chile. I, I went to college in Chile. And even I, I won uh, like an important prize in the museum uh, of uh, National Museum when I was still in college. But uh, I finished uh, college in December and I came here in January. So I leave immediately I could because of you know, but I want to leave after I graduate college. And then, um, so I kind of developed my work in the United States essentially uh, for the last 40 years, but, but mentally, you know, emotionally and, and the vision that I got from Latin America when, when I grew up, you know, that allowed me to have a second view of, of, of issues in general. And then, you know, that bicultural element is, is really relevant in today's society that is changing so rapidly. Definitely. Uh, Susan Anderson says, um, Guillermo, are there other images to show here of the political work you're doing that brings your experiences under a dictatorship together with life under Trump? Uh, I'm not sure if you have any other pieces that you previously selected. Uh, they definitely, I have more neon pieces that they kind of go to that point. And then some of the other pieces related to immigration kind of depict uh, the transition or the, or the uh, result of this politics mm -hmm. when the people have been expelled out or, you know. But definitely the work that I'm doing uh, with the 3D scanning uh, re real people um, and then turning to sculptures uh, by layers it's a very complex uh, and comp uh, you know it's a new pro pro uh, process that I'm developing. Um, is, you know this is going uh, completely in that direction, just kind of create a consciousness about the this immigration project, but you know infused with politics for sure. Thank you, Susan. Definitely. Um, well, I can ask one more question. Um, We've spoken about how political your work is um, with respect, especially with respect to the immigrant narrative and reality. Uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but do you think that story is finished and what's left to tell? What story are you referring to, sorry? Uh, like the immigrant narrative and reality. No, no, actually, no, that's not the, um, finished by any means. Um, I think this is the beginning because mm -hmm. I mean, the immigration is not, um, strictly referring to people that cross borders. It's more like a cultural thing and, and it's, it's, it's international. It's like, uh, we are all immigrants in a way, you know, no matter where you come from, we, we all, we don't belong to any particular place. We are just temporary in one area and then maybe we could move over or not, but mentally the, the ideas move across borders uh, constantly. And then we inherited, you know, um, other cultures without moving physically. So the, the, the culture keep on going around. And one of the series I am developing actually is called uh, uh, cross-pollination. And the idea is that, you know, the bees carrying the pollen and then, you know, this is very important for the, for the growth of, of the forest or the, or the flowers. And the culture is worked the same way, you know, you don't have to have a physical, uh, you know, people to try it over, but the culture's moving, uh, taking over and, and overlap and, and they generate new, new things, new flowers, new, new ideas. So um, this is, 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 is a happening constantly. So uh, it's, it will be um, very interesting to illustrate though, that from, from a different perspective, actually. Hmm. Definitely, thank you. Thank You're you. Uh, thank you, Guillermo, for, for your time for sharing with us your creative process, commitment and, and knowledge, right? Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Gabriela. It was great to have you here. And thank yeah. you, Mola, because uh, I really have a very special place with, with Mola and the dozen, the dozen always, uh, you know, texting me and, and helping me out and, you know, it's great. Yeah, well, we, we hope to see you soon. And, and, and continue working with you uh, for, for different amazing projects. 
And thank you all of you for joining us today. Our next Zoom project will be next Wednesday with the Latinx artist, uh, Patrick Martinez. I hope to see you soon. And thank you so much, Guillermo. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>